Good morning, I'm Ken Bibri and welcome to Coffee with Ken, a thought leadership series at the nexus of business and politics. On our last episode, we spoke with Lakeisha Ann Woods, the CEO of the American Institute of Architects. We covered everything from DEI to the built environment to sustainability and climate change. Check it out on coffeewithken.com. Today, we dive into purpose-driven brand development, and we are joined by Mary Beach, Chief Marketing and Transformation Officer of Scholastic. Mary, great to see you. Love the background. Very on brand. It's important, right? Indeed. Uh, thank you for having me. I am excited to be here. Well, listen, I was so excited to see that you ended up at Scholastic. And I think before we dive into kind of your background and, and purpose-driven uh, purpose brand development, I think it's worth just chatting a couple minutes about Scholastic itself, its legacy and its impact, right? Like, I think it's one of these iconic brands you just know growing up, but kind of helps the level set what it is as kind of a business too, right? So Absolutely. what are you up to over someone, there? Someone recently described Scholastic to me as a tradition. And I do think it is a tradition that that you go through. So Scholastic is the world's largest publisher and distributor of children's books. Um, so I think we're best known for some of the, the series that we publish. We're the publisher of Harry Potter, um, Captain Underpants, you know, Dogman, all of those books. Um, you know, I have all of them. Ma magic <laughs> School Bus. If you're a Magic School Bus fan, that's mm -hmm. us. Um, and then people know us for our iconic experiences. I think our, our book fairs um, in 110,000 schools, our book clubs um, that are still there, the paper flyers you used to get and circle yeah. the books that that's still part of the the tradition and then maybe a little less known um we have an education division so yeah. Scholastic is not just committed to having kids find books they love to read, um, but actually helping kids learn to read, uh, which which does need to happen before you can learn to love to yeah. read so, um, that education arm is important as well and, and look we're gonna spend a bunch of time today talking about brand but transformation is also a big part of your role and, and job. And, and in a brand like this, that's such an iconic legacy tradition, right? Like, how do you approach transformation? Like, what does that mean for Scholastic? It was an incredible moment to, to join the company. So I had been on the board for four years um, when the company faced a, a kind of really important moment. Um, the company had been run for 47 years uh, by the founder's son, um, and he unfortunately uh, passed away. Um, and uh, it was at a moment of uh, tr tremendous change. I mean, that that's a big change to go from yeah. um, one leader for 47 years to a new leader who was a, a fellow board member. And so um, he, he brought me on uh, along with our chairman of the board um, to really Really lead this transformation. And a lot of it is about um, becoming a, a, a digitally informed data led company and data informed company. Um, Scholastic has amazing proprietary data because oh. we know what books kids yeah. choose when they can choose at a fair, when they have the choice of any book they want, what attracts them, um, and the ability to use that data to help inform creative, to help um, find that next book that's going to you know excite a child and keep them reading is really powerful. Um, so it's been, it's just been an amazing, um, t working in change is hard. People, yeah. we do not like change as humans. Um, so, uh, and that is, that's at any company where I've worked. Um, so it's, it's, but it's exciting to be part of it and to determine where are the areas where you can, um, turn somebody from sort of being maybe a detractor to being a supporter awesome. by providing what they need in order to get on board. Love it. And, and so you were on the board, but at the time, you were previously a CEO of Sarah Flynn, right? Like, talk to us about what it was like to be a CEO. I think the timing of that role was also particularly unique. So I, uh, I stepped in to be the yeah. CEO of a startup luxury footwear company on February 13th, 2020. Um, about and everybody five just stopped later. wearing shoes and just wore socks. And, Correct. Yeah, so about, <laughs> about five days uh, after I started, um, Italy um, shut down. If you remember uh, the yeah, it was northern Italy. starting there, mm. where all of our production was. Um, and so it was, you know, this... Uh, kind of looking back on it, a very difficult experience, but a really amazing experience mm -hmm. to um, you know, pivot a company and, and pilot a company through that, along with Sarah herself, who yeah. is just an amazing human, um, and to fundraise uh, and, and keep the company stable and emerge from the other side. So um, definitely, I remember, you know, probably a couple of weeks in, I called a, a mentor who had been on the Kate Speed board. And I said, you know, I, I'm sitting here facing this pandemic as a first time CEO, like, uh, what am I supposed to do? And he said, Mary, no one's been in this situation. Yeah, you Do not have imposter syndrome. You are, you are having the exact set of feelings every CEO is having. No one has faced this situation. So take the preparation that you have and know that you have that same preparation as anyone, which was great advice That's and great. It helped me. 
I was just drinking virtual coffees, Mary. I mean, I just can't <laughs> drink coffee. Um, but what's so fascinating, I think, about this trajectory and kind of telling your story as part of understanding how do you even shape kind of purpose brands, right, is that time at Kate Spade when I first got to know you, right, and kind of thinking back at that, right, like from when you started at Kate Spade to when it actually sold, you know, to coach, right, like that, I'd love to hear about that journey and kind of your work and the people under you, right? Because I think so much of understanding what you do is understanding how creative plays into it, how comms plays into it, how philanthropy, right? Like it's kind of a combination of this stuff where it's like kind of feels like hurting cats, right? Where everyone's different and has a different kind of vision and mission, but it all aligns to the the kind of secret sauce of the culture you create, which then defines the brand, right? So maybe talk a little bit about how you did it and then what the end result was over that period of time that you were there. I mean, brand, brands are a story that yeah. you're telling a story to incite somebody to want to be part of that story um, and to make it really compelling. And I've kind of always viewed myself as a orchestra to conductor conducting yeah. behind. Like I'm, I don't want to be the the person in the front because you do have all these different individual pieces, and if they're playing poorly, it doesn't sound good. Mm. Um, but everybody, if everybody's playing in concert, and you know, Kate Speed was at about 150 million when I joined, um, had a had a direction for growth, but yeah. had really just come out of a turnaround. It had been a brand that had been um, losing money after sort of not being invested in for a couple of years. Um, and we were on this trajectory for growth and and sold to to tapestry for 1.7 billion you know a couple of years later and and it was really about harnessing what was amazing about the brand um but building that out for a, a different day and age so when the brand had launched in the 90s that was a different moment sure. so you had to be aware of what was going to compel consumers what was going to interest them um you know philanthropy was one yeah. of the that had become, I think it's become table stakes. Consumers yeah. want to know that the the companies that they spend money with are helping the world yeah. in some way, in the way that they can. Um, and so be, emboldening that voice and, and making that a big piece of what, you know, Kate Spade was doing. It had always been in the background, you know, there was yeah. that but it was not a public facing. It was sort of the good works that the company did and making that more of a public facing. And then, and, you know, unfortunately, when Kate died by suicide, that really gave us a renewed focus, oh, yeah. which actually shifted our focus to mental health. We had not been focused on mental yeah. health. And today, what the company has done, not yeah. not um, not under my, my leadership, no. but the company's really taken that position around mental health and, and moved that forward in a really profound and I think impactful way. So when did you, I think, start realizing that you had to be so intentional about kind of creating a purpose-driven brand, right? Like, it's one thing as kind of a leader to kind of be like, you have these silos. Okay, I got to make sure creative's doing this and PR is doing this and philanthropy and, you know, marketing, right? Like, when, when and how did it kind of occur to you, the magnitude of the role that you played in these various organizations and actually kind of creating and telling that story? You know, I, I like, is it just like an aha moment or do no, you, no, all, you I mean, know I, it's I, like you're people... conducting? Yeah. I find people fascinating. I always have, and I'm very, so I think I'm a curious person who is always wanting to learn and listen. And I think always trying to tap into what motivates consumers. You know, we, we have choice, we make thousands of choices with our money every single day and what motivates us to make choices, whether we have a lot of that or a little bit of that, those are all choices. And so when you're in a brand, you're in this privileged position of having someone choose you to spend yeah. dollars with, whether that's spending their dollars to buy laundry detergent or spending to dollars to buy a handbag or spending dollars to buy a book. Um, it is a choice. And so what motivates and compels people to make a choice really interests me. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I, I began to see that consumers were, you know, I was seeing some studies about how consumers had, you know, maybe less faith in our um, sort of traditional organizations, government um, and um, public service to do the good in the world. And we're actually starting to expect companies to be part of yeah. the, the changes that they wanted to see. And, and that, that was a big, you know, a big shift. And so I began to see that interest and just feel like it was a part of the story that, you know, if you're not telling your whole story, then you're missing pieces. Yeah. You're giving consumers a chance to um, see that as an element that they can that can help them with that decision making. I also have, um, you know, two kids, and yeah. so they're I very much keenly watch their interests, um, and was seeing them start to say like, 
hey, why do we buy that instead of this when this is more sustainable or when this company does that? And you start to see trends of people talking about that. So um, I love to just study human behavior and, and see what's going on. Um, and I think that helps keep you uh, abreast. So in these various roles, how do you kind of convince senior leadership and folks when the kind of demands from the public it seem to vary, right? Even like companies have to make money, You've even seen in the last four years on just like our series, right? Like when, you know, COVID first started, we started doing COVID with Ken, it was like everything was about ESG, being on the stock market, accountability, responsibility. And then it seems to kind of temper when the economy goes down. And then how do you hold true? How do you, how do companies, how should they kind of hold true to kind of a core set of values that will kind of, you know, be authentic to the brand, right? Like, because if you want to maintain that authenticity, you can't kind of be fickle and like turn it on and off, right? Like, so how do you kind of maintain the will of senior leadership, board members that like, even though it may not be the most profitable decision, it may help kind of tell that story. Like that can't be easy, right? No. It's not easy, but brands are like people. Like we know who we are and we know when we make a choice or an action that is true to us and it's not. And so everyone at the the, the places where I love to work and, and what I try to bring to places is really knowing who your brand is and knowing the values that you have. And by the way, external and internal should match. Yeah. Um, I really feel strongly in that, that, you know, if you're going to put forth a brand to consumers, you better yeah. um, respect those customers internally. You better understand them. Um, you should be talking to them and in dialogue with them constantly. Um, you know, they should be the, the coolest people you'd ever have a chance to meet. So having those values, having that center line is really important. And then that tells you where to weigh in and where to not. So if they're there are changes. You're not being fickle. You can sit there and evaluate from your center line and say, um, "Do I need to? Do I need to make a shift there or not?" Uh, and you know, when when Kate um, Spade passed away, and and we had this, we're doing amazing work on helping yeah. women with the last mile. That was really our focus. Sure. Like, you know, they have some basic needs met, but they need employment. They need to improve their employment. Yeah. And we said, you know, we talked to consumers who all immediately thought that our focus would be mental health. And it was like, okay, wow. that's where we need to shift because our consumer yeah. has gone there because we now have this for better or worse. We have this yeah. mental attachment for people. And so we need to shift there. And it's the same with any other, you know, trend that's there. If if you have a philanthropic core and that's become more important to consumers, you need to, you know, embolden your voice around that. Um, so I do think it's very important for brands today to understand who they are, who they aren't, where customers expect them to show up, and where customers are like, yeah, I don't need my brand there. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. No, no. And look, there's no more iconic brand out there than Disney. And I think you spent a lot of your formative years there. Uh, talk a little bit about that. What was that? The significance of being at Disney when you were there, lessons learned there, and, and kind of what can other companies maybe take away from, from a company of that size, magnitude, and iconic status? I think, you know, Disney is, uh, they're masterful storytellers yeah. and they're masterful storytellers, you know, sort of from literally telling stories yeah. and films and books and television, um, but also just in the way that they think about their brand and how it shows up and also masters at, you know, I think it was Steve Jobs who said you either have brand deposit or brand withdrawal. There's nothing mm -hmm. neutral. Um, oh, okay. Disney really gets that. Like yeah. if you are, you know, parks, the parks and resorts are some, one of the best examples. I recently went as a non-employee yeah. um, for my, after my um, oldest uh, high school graduation. And just, I was impressed. I was impressed yeah. by how the story and the experience wove through every moment, whether that was being on a tram or being on a ride or at a dining experience. Um, so I do think that that, I, I learned a lot about that, that it's not the touch points can be multiple with sure. how you have an experience with a consumer. And if you're only thinking about the transaction, you're not thinking about it accurately. Yeah. What happens when that with that toy when the kid gets it home? Mm. What happens with that book when it comes off the shelf and into the cart and into to the car. Um, and Disney was really good about thinking through all of those touch points. And I think still is. Yeah. And look, you've talked about this in the past, right? You have your own set of mentors, but you obviously go out of your way to mentor others and, and talk to them. You sit on boards, talk a little bit about kind of like your thoughts around advice and guidance. And, and what do you tell, you know, young people starting their own career? What do you tell founders? How do you think about, you know, the impact you can make when you're on a board, right? Like, Talk a little bit more about the kind of value prop you try to pass on to others. You know, I think for a, a long time, Ken, early in my career, I kind of thought that you needed to do it alone. 
that yeah. you, you needed to prove yourself. And, and kind of an, about six or seven years into my time at Disney, and Disney had an amazing team that gave, you know, human resources team that gave tough love. Um, yeah. and, and I got some really great advice that changed my career forever, changed how I showed up as a leader forever. And that moment was so pivotal for, pivotal for me that I decided that, you know, paying it forward was going to be a major part. I mean, I, you know, you can, they talk about resume virtues and sort of obituary virtues. Like I don't want to end my life having someone go, wow, that was an impressive resume. Mm. I want to end my life with someone saying like, Mary said something to me that had meaning, or I had a relationship or yeah. I got help in my career. So I really view it as a part of my job to give back to people. Uh, I'm very lucky at Scholastic that they have formal That's mentoring crazy. programs. It's, you know, I've always done it informally here. It's quite formal. Um, yeah. Our young professionals um, ERG um, runs it and I've participated, you know, the entire time I've been here. Um, and then I have lots of informal mentoring relationships. Um, and I view the same way as, as boards, like as someone who has had boards of directors um, as an employee that have really helped me with unlocks or thinking about things differently. That's the role of a board member. You're not operating the business. Yep. You're going to walk out of that room and you have another yeah. you know, 60 days before you're going to be yeah. um, diving back in. But your, your job is to introduce friction or to uh, ask a question or make someone think a little bit differently um, to, to provide advice. Uh, and that is um, really important. It's to support the CEO in being able to do their work um, in the right way and to be a, a voice for the shareholders. So um, I love that. I oh, love that opportunity. Ah. And, and I've always kind of thought of you as someone who's, who's reflective, right? Like you spend time writing on weekends. You recently posted something around kind of like the gratitude lens. Talk a little bit about that, right? Where you kind of like, how do you kind of stop the noise and kind of mentally take care of yourself or have the time to kind of write and think and, you know, how important is that? How do you weave it in? I mean, you're busy, you have it's a lot going really, on, you have two kids. It's... And you know, where we put our effort is, you know, where something matters to yeah. us. And I think that um, for a long time, I, you know, as a young wife and mother and executive, um, I kind of viewed, you know, I, I just didn't have time to do it all. And mm -hmm. then I realized I'm never going to have time to do it yeah. all. What is the all that I want to do? And so prioritizing those things of making sure, you know, I I'm not going to spend time with my husband unless I have a date night set up, unless yeah. we take that time and are intentional about it. Um, it you know, we're going to lose that relationship if we're not intentional with my kids. It has to be intentional moments and time that I'm spending, especially as I have teenagers now, and th they're naturally wanting to spend less time. You have to make more intention to spend that time. Um, and it's the same with, you know, being intentional. Like I had always been wanting to write. I love to write. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's not just going to naturally happen. Um, and so saying, you know what, I'm going to write for an hour on Saturdays and I'm going to be really um, intentional about it. Even if for four years, Ken, it was just sitting in a folder. I didn't do anything with it. Yeah, um, I was just doing it for me. And yeah. occasionally I'd share a piece with someone if I felt like, wow, I might have something that can help someone. But it it was just for me. And that yeah. I think it's like deciding what is important to you and what matters and then putting your time there if you're able to. Hey, and how important is it to just start and just yeah. do it? Like, why, how much of this is about just like the fear? Like, even with these talks, it was just kind of like, you can overthink it to the point of paralysis, right? I mean, you just, sometimes you just got to do stuff and it may not don't be let, prettier don't, than the best Don't let perfect, as we were talking earlier, don't <laughs> let perfect stand in the way of, of yeah. just getting something done. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for, brands, for people, for businesses. Um, sometimes we do, we convince ourselves of all the reasons not to, and you should think through those things. Sure. Um, but you should sometimes just do it and see what could happen and what the outcome could be. Yeah. So when you think about, you know, new companies getting started and charting their course, you know, you had this at Sarah Flint, right? Like you're focused on raising money, you're focused on selling, right? Like, how do you actually then create kind of purpose behind your brand? Like what are the mechanics of like, there's not really a playbook, right? Like how do you kind of it's not, but I do, have to, yeah. I do think it's important to sit down with an, I think one, you know, in startups, you're yeah. moving incredibly quickly, which is, I, I just love that energy and that urgency and the nimbleness for with which they approach things, but really sitting down and codifying it almost forces you to then say what what actually are those things and sitting down and saying why do we exist like why should this brand be 
on the planet? Um, why this and not something yeah. else? Why should consumers spend their money with you? And sitting down and codifying that for yourself and being very clear that everybody at your company understands that and can choose to be part of that or choose not to, because we're employed at will, yeah. ours and the companies. <laughs> and so we should be very, very clear um, on who we are. And I, I believe strongly in codification. I think mm. the process of sitting down writing down your values, writing down your guiding behaviors, writing down your purpose for, you know, today and the next 10 years. Um, I think we should do that personally. What is yeah. our personal purpose? Um, and I think doing that, you can hire consultants, you can bring people in, but I think just doing it with your team or the people that you respect the most is really important. Um, and you may need to evolve it. I think, you know, there, there is evolution that can happen, but I don't think it should be revolution. I think there can be small tweaks as you learn more and realize um, a new value might be incredibly, you know, you may have had guiding behaviors that got you to a certain point, but you need to introduce some others to get you to the next point. That's fine. Uh, but I do think that codification is a step that is um, often skipped by companies large and small. Interesting. So talk a little bit, you know, we don't exist in kind of, you know, a sterile environment. Crises come up, you know, chaos happens, the world's on fire. How do you deal with the kind of ups and downs of a business cycle? How do you maintain this kind of brand purpose and identity through it? I mean, you talked a little bit about Kate Spade, right? You had to make a pivot, but it was still an authentic pivot, right? Like, how do you kind of react? To I mean, crisis? having having, yeah. having a strong purpose doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, negate crises happening it doesn't you can't just point to it and be like, but i have a purpose right? i have a purpose you should love me um it it doesn't stop you from even from making mistakes like those those things continue to happen as uh, in business and in, mm -hmm. in society i think what what it helps with is providing a place to come back to a center line that allows you to see what the customer is seeing and say okay we've made a misstep we need to go back to the center or this crisis is going to pass if we stay on this line and we can't allow this to pull us too far away and yeah. to that direction. Um, and I think, I do think that having those, listen, we all have behavior that comes out in advantageous circumstances and we all have the place we go in disadvantageous circumstances. But when you have core values and guiding behaviors for you as an individual and as a colleague, um, it does help in those disadvantageous times to be able to say like, hey, I didn't completely show up in that moment yeah. in a way that was, you know, um, you know, thinking collaboratively because you know, it was a crisis. But I, you recognize it yourself, and you're able yeah. to correct yourself. The brand is able to correct itself. Um, so that's why I think codifi codifying in a time yeah. of good will really help you when you get to those moments where um, there's going to be crisis, and they will happen. They will yeah. happen. So when you look to kind of the landscape of companies and businesses, domestic, globally. Are there certain companies that you just love and you're like, they're doing it right? Like, who are your favorites? I like the Patagonias of the world, obviously Disney, right? Like, who do you kind of look at and aspire and kind of, you know, take note of? And maybe it's subtle or something like that. I mean, there's certainly brands that yeah. I really admire because I think they tell just a really pointed story to the customer mm -hmm. who um, wants them and have very clear purpose. So I'm a runner. Um, I really love Tracksmith, uh, their brand that came out of oh. them years ago that um, really focused on runners who, um, you know, not definitely elite runners, but also runners like myself, who I am not an elite runner, but I do run. I don't know about that. You run what? How many I'm marathons? marathons but like, I'm not setting any time records, uh, but I, I do them and I complete them. <laughs> And that really appeals to me. And, you know, they've they've made missteps, actually interesting, in the past few years, but you focused on the elite side. And I think they've um, been able to come back and say, like, we're an inclusive brand. We want to be there for people who love running. So I really admire their product. I admire their story. Um, I, you know, I remain a huge fan of Disney. I think that um, it's an incredible company with an incredible, um, you know, touch points with consumers. Um, so I remain a, a big, big fan of those. And then I think there's a lot of really interesting startups out there that are making a, a big difference, um, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I love people who are doing things differently. Who Gives a Crap is a toilet paper company that has yeah. revolutionized the way that toilet paper, which is, you know, incredibly yeah. environmentally not sustainable, yeah. um, is, is developed and delivered. Um, so I'm a big, a big proponent of Who Gives a Crap. Um, and, and just brands that are trying to say, here's a consumer problem and how can we solve that problem for consumers in a new yeah. and innovative way?
I was just thinking about like our recap email. I was going to be like, who gives a crap? Very <laughs> beach. I love it. Now, um, so before I let you go, right, I want to come back to Scholastic, right? Because it really is this brand where, I mean, half the time you can almost think that it's a nonprofit, for goodness sakes, right? Because of like the involvement and connectivity and the kind of, you know, purpose that's been created behind the brand identity. But Scholastic Impact is an actual kind of effort, right? Talk a little bit about, you know, kind of benchmarks where you spend the organization spends its time kind of giving back and, you know, what do those buckets look like? What's the impact um, just in general? Yeah. Sure. So you know, Scholastic is a very interesting company. I've, I've worked at a lot of companies that had a purpose. Most companies I've worked with had a purpose or reason to exist. Scholastic is truly a purpose-driven company. You know, everybody here every day is thinking about how can we help kids learn to read and learn to love to read. And then it is in many parts, uh, a ways, a double bottom line company. I mean, our entire business model of book fairs is set up as a give back to schools. We give back $200 million a year to schools. Uh -huh through those book fairs, which are co-hosted with the school. Um, our book clubs give about 6 million books a year to teachers um, through the, the, you know, the give backs that happen through the participating in the club. Um, and then there's a, a philanthropic arm that is part of the, the company as well. Um, so it really is, you know, the opportunity, we think about it as book access and book discovery and, and the learning to read piece. Um, and it's very interesting to work at a company like that, where everything is focused on um, this very clear direction of how can we help more kids read read and more kids find books that they want to read. Mm -hmm. And so it, it often was when I first, you know, when I got here, I was like, I didn't know all these things. I didn't I know, know the funny. company was doing these things. And my first year we did our first philanthropic impact report um, and we published our second one recently. And it was even just internally for people to go, wow, yeah. I didn't realize all the areas of impact that we had because I mean, in a lovely way, people just here did the good works. They didn't yeah, talk it's incredible. The good works. Um, yeah. so it was just this real opportunity to tell that story yeah. and to make sure people knew that when they were voting with their dollars with Scholastic, that there was, you know, they were having an impact and yeah. they were giving back as well. So that's been, you know, it's been powerful to discover that and to, from my colleagues, learn about what it's like to work at a place like that and how it, you know, provides a sense of purpose for people. So just on that thread, right? Because I think it's so important and worth kind of pausing on. So much of I think that I think about you with is is not only the external messaging of purpose, but the internal. And I feel like that's really understated with organizations all over the place. Like that's a perfect example, right? Like people across Boston didn't even realize the magnitude of impact, right? Like, you know, how do you think do you divide your time thinking internally, externally? I mean, it's yeah. I think, I think as a person, I've always, I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I've spent my career working with creative talent. I'm married to creative, someone who is in the creative industry and is incredibly talented. And, and part of working with creatives is, is retaining them and keeping them excited. Like when you find an amazing cr person who has yeah. just incredible creative talent, you want to retain them. You want to do everything you can to, to keep that talent. And so I think I've always thought about people as the most important asset of a company. Yeah. I, I truly do think yep. that so you are nothing if, if you don't have great people. And so you need to, as a leader, I think, be thinking as often, if not more often, about your internal teams, because yeah. they are what's going to unlock the power of the brand financially, unlock that you know shareholder value for you. Mm -hmm. And so it shouldn't be the job of the HR department. Yeah. And I, I've just never understood that. The my CEO at um, at Disney, Andy Mooney, um, you know, I had he put in an HR department that was involved in a way that I had never participated, you know, experienced. Like they were involved in meetings and they were involved because they were about developing people because people. Yeah set. And so I learned that mm -hmm. there and then really have taken that on that I don't even think I have to think about it anymore. It's That's just galvanizing yeah. people and keeping people um, motivated yeah. and excited to come to work for you every day. It should be our main job. Oh, I love it. Well, last question, then I'll let you go. Um, we always kind of like to ask, is there a call to action? Like, how should people be thinking about Scholastic? Like, if you're a private company, if you're an individual, if you're, you know, somebody in a position to to give back? I mean, are there certain kind of calls to action for people to get more involved? I mean, I feel like this is such a great opportunity having you and talking about Scholastic, but it's kind of gotten me excited about, like, how do I get more well, Scholastic? Obviously, I would life? love people to support their local yeah. book fairs, their local book clubs um, to, to, to do that. But I one call to action I would just have that really, you know, Donna, me, when I became a Scholastic board member, you know, 
learning to read is not a natural thing. You know, if you were left alone on a desert island, you would figure out how to speak. You know, you would learn vocal, you would you would vocalize. You would not, if there was a bunch of books there, you would not learn to read them. You have to be taught to read. Yeah. And so I think taking that and understanding that and finding those moments in your community where you can be part of helping kids who may not have the same advantage that you had as a child with the same set of people around them. Um, I'm very passionate. Reading unlocks everything for us. Yeah. It unlocks socio socioeconomic participation, civic participation, um, longevity, even there are studies. So I think the more that, you know, your, your fans can do to um, really think about reading as something that's fundamental and something if they can find ways to give back, um, I would love that. Okay. Amazing. Mary, what a treat. So good to see you as always.